Konnichiwa, and welcome to episode 63 of the Leadership Japan series. And I'm your host in Tokyo, Dr. Greg Story, president of Dale Carnegie Training Japan. And much more importantly, you, the listener, are a student of leadership, highly motivated to be the best in your business field. If you enjoy the program, then you might consider subscribing on iTunes and leaving a review. We would love to hear what you think about the series. How would you like your own access to 102 years of the accumulated wisdom of Dale Carnegie training? For free! You can get our free report, Stop Wasting Money on Training, How to Get the Best Results from Your Training Budget, plus we have free white papers, free guidebooks, reports, training videos, blogs, newsletters, course information, plus much, much more at japan.dalecarnegie.com. And today we're going to listen to a lecture or a presentation given to the McGill University MBA class here in Tokyo on how to be a leader who can super motivate staff. And Greg is a big supporter of this program. He's been coming to give talks since about 2007, uh, years and years ago. He actually gave the graduation speech in 2009. So uh, we really appreciate uh, Greg coming back to speak with us. So. Uh, Today's format is similar as, as the same as before. Uh, we'll have a, a presentation by Greg, then questions and answers, and then we'll spend a little time to give you a chance to uh, network and, and exchange uh, Meishi if you like. Uh, just before we get started, what I'm going to talk about today is leadership and how to motivate people. And one of the issues in success in business is it's very hard to be successful if you can't take the people with you. Unless you want to be doing everything yourself. So, leading people is not such a straightforward thing. What are some of the issues that you found so far in your businesses with people? What's difficult about people? Give me some feedback here. What's difficult about people? Mm -hmm. people. <laughs> <laughs> what's, another what's another one? What's another difficulty you find with dealing with people? Understanding their motivations. Understanding their motivations, yes. What else? Obviously, no one has any trouble with people in this class. Right? <laughs> Big egos, okay. Try and understand how to deal with people who are probably highly driven but hard to handle. Yep. People that compare themselves to other people. People who compare themselves to other people. What other people are getting like Oh, worried about their package or their bonus or their conditions of work and then whinging about it to you, probably. Yeah, what else do we have? What else is doing working with people? Emotions, yes. People are not, you know, inanimate objects. They are driven by emotion, actually. We, you know, we justify with logic, but actually it's a lot of emotional things going on there for us. In this time we have left today, I'm going to give you as much as I can to help you to become much more successful in dealing with people. And at the end, I'll try and give you an opportunity to find where to get more help if you, if you want it. And also, please remind me at the end too, uh, if you'd like to get the video of this and my slides, I'm very happy to share them. Just at the end, just quickly give the information to me and I'll, I'll send it to you. Does that sound fair? Sounds good? Okay. So, we start... We start with Dale Carnegie, 24 years old, probably about the same age as some of the people in this room, I'm looking around here maybe, I'm not sure, but a uh, young man starts a company. He starts a brand new business. It's a business in the self-help industry which didn't exist when he started his business. He created an industry. And maybe like you, he's facing many fears, how am I going to run this business, where am I going with this? But he was an overnight success. It just took 24 years to get there. All right? And over those 24 years, 
as he's conducting his classes, helping people be better with other people, it was like a living laboratory for him. And he's getting ideas, and he's getting examples, and he's getting problems, and he's making note of these, and he's working out solutions, and he's recording his solutions, and he's polishing, and he's polishing, and he's polishing. And finally, in 1936, he gets Simon & Schuster, which is a massive book brand in the publishing world, to publish an unknown, unheard of author who runs a training company. And he... In today's parlance, we'd say his success went viral with this book. And it didn't only go viral, it went viral globally. So here's a guy who went from being a well-known person in the training business to being a global guru. And in Japan, his books in translation have sold more than nine million copies. So, you are in a living laboratory right now. Wherever you are working, whatever you are doing, you see staff going well and you see staff not going so well. Grab it. Grab it. This could be your book. This could be your viral It may not be Simon & Schuster. It may be on Kindle. It may be an e-book. But, you have got the living laboratory opportunity right where you are to take a leaf out of the book of someone like Dale Carnegie and become a global superstar. Validation of what you're doing is very critical. How would you like to be able to say 90% of the Fortune 500 companies use my solution? That's not bad, is it? It's a validation. That's what he achieved. How would you like to have a testimonial from the most successful businessman in world history. Warren Buffett is by far the most successful business person in world history. And he is a massive fan of Dale Carnegie. This is a screenshot from a CBC broadcast of an interview with him in his office in Omaha in Nebraska. And he's pointing there to his Dale Carnegie certificate that he got in his early 20s. He was a guy who had such high intellect and such brilliant ideas and couldn't get anybody to go with him, to give him money to invest on their behalf. Don't you wish you'd given him some money back then? <laughs> Imagine how much that'd be worth now. But he wasn't getting anywhere. And his, one of his friends said, hey, Dale. No, sorry. He said, hey, hey, Warren, do the Dale Carnegie course. So he did the course, changed his life. And how do we know it changed his life? Because we have a testimonial video with him on this program saying, it changed my life. So, in your business, in your, be it your own business or where you are now, where are the validations? Where are the testimonials? Where are the opinion leaders that you can draw on to make what you're doing more convincing, more credible to your business audience? And in Japan, we have a good example, and previous chairman, uh, now emeritus chairman of Google, Mukami-san, who's again a young man, went to the Dr. E course, became a convert, used the principles, went to the very top, and he writes and speaks, and he's a great advocate for what Dale Carnegie brought to his business career. And we just see this replicated time after time. And 125th Street in Harlem, New York, at the YMCA, one man, one class, one product, to today, 91 countries around the world with offices. We cover more than 91 countries, but we have 91 countries with offices around the world and treat in more than 30 languages. So if you think about it, if you're like a Mikitani, for example, right? He was like one guy in Japan. And I was just at the headquarters say, in Shinagawa yesterday. There's like two huge towers. They're moving to Futako Tamagawa and this huge building. It's thousands of people. It's phenomenal. So these are the sorts of examples that we can encourage ourselves with. But we can actually also have that capacity. Now here's the bad news. Sorry to bring up some bad news. Business is all messed up. It's totally got it around the wrong way. We are all told hard skills, technical skills, expertise, knowledge, all of these things are critical for your success. Well, that's baloney. That's baloney. That's not enough. That's absolutely not enough. You can have hard 
high core technical skills. That's great. Then what happens? You do a good job. And then what happens? They promote you. This is where the trouble starts. As a technical person, as an expert in your area, you are fantastic in your world that you control for yourself. They recognize your potential and promote you, and they don't train you properly. They don't transition you properly into a more difficult level role. And suddenly, you're dealing with all of these emotional people. People who've got big egos. People who are bitching about everything. <laughs> and you're in charge. And suddenly you found that all the things that were brilliant for you doesn't translate to other people. And they are not on the same page as you. But you've got to lead them. So very quickly you find there's a limit to people with what you can do with your technical skills. It requires another skill set. Now, I'm not going to make a guess, but I'm probably doubtful there are very many MBA courses which has people skills as a subject. They probably have organizational behavior or leadership and these sorts of things. But the practical, on the ground people skills is what makes the job of a person who's promoted on their capability to a leader successful. Now, we might think, hey, look, there's no problem. It's technology is going to be the answer. I'll be saved. I'm a crap people leader, but I'll be okay because I have got technology backing me up. I'll be great. Well, good luck with that one. We haven't quite worked out yet how to automate leadership. Okay, we're working on it. We haven't got there yet. So in the meantime, it's you. Right? So if you think the sort of 24-hour, seven days a week environment, technological advancement is going to make the difference for you, Try it, it won't work for you. You need people skills, you need to have that one-on-one. -on -one. Now, you know, think global, learn English, you're told all these sorts of things, you know. The trouble is, if you're rude <laughs> in three languages, you're still a dork. And the people who are working for you think you're a dork. And if you're transferred overseas, the people there think you're a dork too. Just because you speak the language doesn't help. You speak your own language, it doesn't help. So, all this thing about globalization, if we're going to learn English in Japan, and we're going to be brilliant, Japan's going to have a global empire again, it's all going to be good. It's not going to work unless the people themselves have got that capability to work with other people. Now, people have got so many universal traits that when you go to a foreign country, yes, there are the cultural aspects, but this is very key. People often miss this point. We all have personality styles. And the personality styles are often much more important to deal with than the cultural traits around nationality and upbringing. If you're a very micro-detailed person, and I'm a big picture person, we're going to have a terrifically hard job to have a conversation. You know, if I'm a hard-driving New Yorker, and I stand right in front of your face, and I talk aggressively, and it's direct, and you're Japanese. <laughs> Well, that's going to go pretty bad, right? Because you're looking for something more consensual, not so aggressive, wondering how people feel. You see, so those sorts of things in business are overriding culture. Now, the fact that they might be German or Australian or whatever, irrelevant, these things override that. So we've got to go beyond these sort of simple ideas to go a bit deeper. We talk about people skills. What are these people skills? It's the ability to understand people, get them with you on the journey. Now, you know, leading people is basically pretty easy. It's getting them to follow you that's a tricky part. And that's where the people skills come in. So, communication, empathy, getting people around a clear vision of where we go, making sure the values of the organisation are common. Making sure that people understand the why in your communication. As often we give them the what and the how, but we forget the why part. All of these things with people skills make a difference. So, where do you think some of the challenges are for yourself around people skills? What do you think are some of the people skill challenges that you have? Give me some feedback here. What have we got? Yes, put it on. I know the great answer. Some 
So I just didn't quite catch it. Could you say that a little bit louder? So people, you say their moods, can't control their moods, did I hear that? I, I cannot uh, control 100% my uh, emotions. Oh, yours, as a, as a leader. Yeah. Right, so that's right. If you've had a very bad day, you might be a bit grumpy, and then, you know what? Every single person in this room is an absolute expert boss watcher. <laughs> Every single one of you. The boss walks in the door, Bingo, you've got it, or her. Oh, they're in a good mood today. Can I present that project or idea? Oh, they're not in a bad a good mood today. I'll leave it till tomorrow. Oh, they look really busy. I shouldn't interrupt them. We are, we are all trained to read every tiny nuance of our boss. Now, guess what? When you become the boss, that's what happens to you. So when you walk in the door and you look like a little... You know, dark cloud of rain pouring over your head. <laughs> Everyone's going to avoid you like the plague. In the communication, the whole thing's going to go down. So as the uh, boss, one of the people skills is to always be bright and upbeat. Because you are the mood maker. You are the mood maker for the entire organisation. And people are watching you so minutely. So that's one, that's one very good issue. What's another issue about people skills? Yeah, please. Um, being assertive and not giving in to external pressure. External pressure from where? From uh, maybe the people around you, for example. Like if you're someone who uh, is, does things to try to make people happy, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, really easy to, um, I guess, give in on what you believe is the right thing to do, but maybe it's getting resistance from those around you. So asserting yourself in that fashion. So how to be assertive without upsetting everybody? How to, we have a, a, a course actually called how to disagree agreeably for that very reason. How can we have a difference of opinion but not destroy the relationship? So how can you have a different idea on things to somebody else and be persuasive enough to get them to say, you know what, I actually, I, I didn't think that, but listening to you, I see the logic of that, I'm going to change my mind, or at the minimum, I'm going to disagree agreeably with you in a way that our relationship's not broken. This is one of the critical things we need to learn. And the thing is, we don't get taught this in school. We don't get taught this university. It's a, it's a practical skill, and we need to do better. Who would like to be better at people skills? Only three people. I can't be right. <laughs> I've got glasses on the check. Okay, yes, many people. Of course we do. It's a critical thing. Trick is, though, how? How can we get people to come with us? How can we get people to sign on? How can we get people motivated to go with us? Well, we can pay them a lot of money. Who would like to get a lot more money? Why don't we just pay, why don't we just pay everybody a truckload of money? Right? They're bound to be happier. They're bound to need more money. Is that reasonable? Well, it is reasonable except if it's your company. Okay? It is reasonable except if you've got a budget. It is reasonable except you've actually had the budget cut, which is normally how it works, right? So if we can't throw money at them, then... What are some levers that we can pull? And if you've got, like me, I own this business, so one of the constant things you're struggling with when you run a small business is your fixed costs relative to your variable costs. And that impacts your cash flow. Your cash flow impacts your capacity to invest in your business to grow. So paying a truckload of money to people for someone like me in business is not an option. I have to have other levers I can pull because that is certainly nothing I can... I can go to, and I don't know that very many people are 100% motivated by money anyway. You're going to find a very small percentage of transactional people, often trading industries, who are totally motivated by money and don't care about anything else. And in those businesses, that probably works. But that is a very, very microscopic minority of people. Most people want more than money. They want recognition. They want status, that ego thing, coming back to the ego thing. They want to feel that they're doing something worthwhile. They're working you know, like crazy. Is this really worthwhile? What am I doing? Am I valued? Am I valued around my work environment for my professional effort? That's a very critical thing. And it's not about money. Money's important, but it's not the only thing. And you can't afford to pay them a truckload of money anyway, most times. How do you get people like this to be engaged? Huh? Get this type of level of engagement. That's what you've got to look at today a little bit. One of the problems, though, is... 
engagement is a critical factor for innovation. If people don't care, why would they innovate? If people have signed on, what do they care if the process improves? Right? So, if we're doing the same things in the same way, we will get the same result. Does that make sense? Right? So, if you wanted to have a better result, and I, I am absolutely certain that all of your bosses, you're running your own organisation, you will all want, year to year, an improved result. If you want that, that represents a change. So, you know, the same thing, same result. No, you want something different for a better result. The problem is, all of us are pretty resistant to change. And you'll find that your team are pretty resistant to change too. Because they're in their comfort zone. They're in the mothership. It's comfortable there. A change represents risk. Now, is Japan a country where people are prone to take risks? <laughs> right? And you're the leader. And you're going to take people who are risk resistant, risk averse, with you on a journey into something new and untried before. That's not so easy. So in some ways, managing and leading in Japan is quite challenging for that reason. You probably, like me, I, I catch the same train to work every day. I stand in front of the same carriage door because at the other end, the escalator is right there. I take exactly the same route to work. I eat in the same 20 restaurants. I, you know, I have a small group of friends I'm comfortable with. We're all like that. We've eliminated what's dangerous, what's costly, what's time inefficient. We're very effective around that. The problem is we're asking for you to do something new. So how do we get people to take a risk and take on the opportunity of something that they haven't got today that's better? Well, it's not so easy. Now, this is another piece of bad news. The training in most companies doesn't provide that. <coughs> it just doesn't work. So you think, well, I'm the, I'm the leader, and I've got the HR department there, or the training department there, or the whiz bang, central training from you know, wherever it comes from. They'll take care of that for me. Well, good luck with that one. Because what you'll find is that most training does not do much more beyond information transmission. But you are not interested in transmission. You are after transformation. Because you want people out of that comfort zone, take on something new, and go into the future as something better and brighter. That's not information download. That's transformation. Now, the training, for the most part, challenges. If you're the boss, and they say we've got training for your people, really look at it and ask yourself, the way this curriculum is structured, and the way this training is delivered, is there going to be a comfort zone expansion part of this, or is there going to be a bunch of people sitting around, bored out of their minds, writing down, particularly in Japan, sensei, who just talks and talks and talks and talks <laughs> to your dead. <laughs> Maybe that's not the model for transformation. Maybe that's not the model for expanding the comfort zone. So, as a leader, look very carefully at what's happening in the training environment. And when I meet senior leaders, and I meet a lot of them all day long, because that's my job, okay, that's called prospecting, okay, for those of you who are in the sales area, meeting the leaders, and I meet two types of leaders. I have the leader type who doesn't care about the training, they only care about themselves. You know, how's my bonus going, how am I looking at the uh, upper echelon of my company, I'm not worried about anybody else, so therefore I don't care about their training. That's one type of boss. The other type of boss is they're very innocent. Oh yeah, I want to know about the training. I want to make sure my people develop. I want to see my people grow. Because I know, as they grow, they've got to take me and push me up the ladder to give me something bigger to run. Because they're looking for leaders who can have people grow. Right? So, this is, just to give an example, we have been very, very fortunate. Dale Carnegie found the secret sauce in that long maturation period of developing his business and his training methodology that he found how to get both the information across the people, but also transformationally expand that comfort zone at the same time. And I asked headquarters at uh, the Dale Carnegie University in the States, I said, look, give me five years, all trainers, all training from the most simple module, two hours, to the most complicated product that we offer. What's the average satisfaction rate? And this is what came back. So when we look at this, think about your own environment how can you make sure that the development of your people has got that 
improvement capacity around expanding the comfort zone. Because if you don't expand the comfort zone, the information will go straight in here and go straight out there. So who would like to have an opportunity to see your people grow as a leader? Who would like to see their people grow? Only three people. That can't be right. There's a lot of people not putting their hand up here. I'm extremely worried about the content of this MBA now, Philip. <laughs> they don't want their people to grow up. This is going to be the next leader generation. Hmm, okay. So, here's one of the problems too. You know? If you've got a good coach, are you going to have bad people? Probably not. If the coach is very good, the coach is going to develop the people. And so you're going to get improvement, you're going to get progress. The problem is, how do we get people to become good coaches? How do you, as a leader, become a good coach? What can you do to become better in your people skills, communication skills, motivational skills with people, to help them go forward. Because in their growth is your success. In their capacity to do more is your capacity to step up. And every organization, particularly in this country in the last five years, screaming out for leadership. They're screaming out for people who can take groups of people and make them more productive. They're looking for leverage. They're looking for that ability to drive things up. So trust me, if you've got that capacity to help people grow, they will produce more and you will have a much bigger job or a much bigger business or a much more successful organization. They're all linked. And you might think, well, you know, my organization has got management systems. They've got an HR department. It's all sort of in place. I'm just painting my numbers, you know. I go and do the performance review and then we work out the bonuses and it's all going to be great. Well, good luck with that one. Most management systems are archaic, basically. It's a very old model, and most HR departments, particularly in Japan, are way behind. The concept in a Japan HR about being a partner to the business, to be someone who actually is not ticking boxes, oh, we did this, oh, we completed that, that's done, but actually grows the business, grows the people, is very remote in the HR industry in this country today. So if you're a leader and you're relying on them, good luck. There may be some information exchange, but there'll be no transformation. People will not grow. The boxes will be ticked. People go to the training and they come back and they're just doing exactly what they've always been doing. And that's going to be very frustrating for you. Now, talk about engagement. This is uh, Charlie Ergen. He's the chairman of DISH Networks. The meanest company in America. It strikes fear into employees. I love this bit. Staff clock in with a fingerprint scanner so HR knows if you're late. How about we get that down at your shop, all right? And you can scan everybody's fingerprints when they come to work and see if they're late or not. And he says, I don't hold myself up as a great manager. Well, that type of environment is pretty harsh. What do you think the engagement level is going to be like in that company? What do you think? Low, right? Pretty bad. This is a bit closer to home. This is Carnival. I read this in the newspaper. This lady in her 60s wasn't hitting her sales targets. So as a punishment, they got her to dress up in a bunny outfit. Right? <laughs> she took them to court, and she won. She won in court. The cost to Carnival was not the court settlement that they had to pay her <coughs> as a result of the judgment. The cost to Carnival has been that type of environment, that type of mentality, and what it does to motivation, what it does to engagement. And engagement leads directly to innovation. So if you're not getting all of these things to line up, you've got a huge problem around taking your, your whole uh, company forward. This is a, a polling question we did. We actually did a survey globally in 2012-13 uh, looking at what drives engagement in people. And we came up with three things. And this is actually taken from uh, a course we ran here a number of times in Japan, uh, both with pure Japanese uh, participants and sometimes Japanese and foreign mixed groups, asking uh, these number of questions. And, you see, the, the highest ones that come out there, satisfaction with the immediate manager, belief in senior leadership, and pride in the organization, actually completely validated and correlated with the result of that research. We did research all around the world, including Japan, a thousand people here as well. And we found that these were the three things that really triggered engagement. Now, they're very obvious. You know, satisfaction with the immediate manager. But as I said before, if the immediate manager is a dork, and the immediate manager has got very poor people skills, very poor communication skills, is very, very intelligent, very technical, but useless as far as motivating people, then the engagement level is going to be low. If they're not communicating properly, the people aren't going to have faith 
in where the senior management is taking the organisation. And this becomes an issue. People don't sign on for the journey if they don't know why the journey is important. But this often happens in organisations. The suite at the top of the building, the penthouse sort of executive suite, the top floor, with the uh, gorgeous looking girl receptionist in the short skirts and the beautiful flower arrangement and the quiet, and you can hear a pin drop. There's plenty of uh, executive suites like that in Japan. You've probably seen them. I've seen plenty. But people at that level are all thinking our vision, our mission, our values are understood by everybody in the organisation and we are like a huge ship sailing together in the same direction and we're all on board, we're all good. The reality though is that the belief in senior leadership is weak. Why is it weak? Mainly because of people like you. I look around here, a lot of you are probably middle managers. You're in some level of leadership position probably in your company. You are absorbing like rain, you know, all this information from above, but you're like a concrete floor in a building. None of it goes through. Because you tell people the what, and you may tell them the how, but you forget to tell them the why. Or maybe you're not even getting the why from the guys above. Maybe all you're getting is what and how as well. It's very hard to get people to believe in senior leadership if they don't know why we are doing this, and they're not signed up. So don't forget to tell people the why of what you're doing. The last one there is pride in the organisation. Now sometimes in organisations, people try to use an us and them technique. So it's us, our work group, against them, the rest of the organisation. Oh, those people in logistics, my goodness gracious me, they're hopeless. Marketing, oh no, what are they doing down there? Nothing ever works, I never get any leads. Those salespeople, they couldn't sell anything. They are the most useless bunch of people I've ever seen in my life. Everyone's whinging and bitching about everybody else. Right? They're blaming everybody else. And sometimes the leaders, sub-leaders, encourage this. Yeah, we're good, they're bad. They're talking about their own organisation. Right? The bad should be the competitor. Right? Should be all like a scrum. We're all good, they're bad. But no, they kill the pride of the organisation because they have a very poor understanding of their communication role, people skills, how to drive motivation in the organisation, how to pull people together, and their role as an amplifier, as a conduit, as a microphone to broadcast what the top leadership is thinking and why they're thinking that. So don't miss that opportunity in your current role to make that happen. So this is a great quote from a Canadian, Phil, a Canadian. Did you like that? I got a Canadian quote here, it's particularly because it's McGill. And I, but I don't know this guy. You know this guy, Yannick Nezeskren? I don't know him, but he must be famous in Canada, I presume. He said, I'll read this just quickly. He says, fear doesn't work. It shuts down the emotional level. Woo! That is a very key piece. Now, power of persuasion, be sincere, honest, prepared. Your power is psychological. Oh, this is critical stuff. This is critical stuff. Now, this is great insight from a conductor of an orchestra. Because when we did our research on what drives motivation and engagement, we found that a key trigger was an emotional reaction. I feel valued. I feel valued by my team and my boss. That simple emotional trigger was a starting point for people to feel more inspired about what they're doing. A bit more enthusiastic, put a bit more effort into it. Empowered, feeling trusted, that they can take a risk, they can try something new, they can have a suggestion, they can lead a project. And also, related to their confidence, which comes back to that sense of empowerment. So, don't miss that. If you're a cold, hard, technical, skilled person, thinking technical skills is everything, you're going to miss the fact that for your people, that's not enough. They may respect you as a technical expert, but they still may think you're a dork. And they don't want to work hard for you. And they can't wait till you get fired so they can get somebody else who is a bit better. Right? That's what they're thinking. So a trigger to engagement is that starting point of being valued. So how do we feel valued? I'm going to go through a couple of the Dalton principles that he came up with on how to build people skills and build better relationships with each other. And now all of these things are very simple in understanding. They're common sense. But they are not common practice, which is the problem. So, muzzle humid, right? Muzzle humid. Here with praise and honest appreciation. Okay, hands up. Today is uh, Saturday. 
Last week, who had a conversation with their boss, where their boss began that conversation with praise to you and honest appreciation for your efforts? Please put your hand up. <laughs> Two people. We started the conversation, right? Not, not at the end of the conversation, we started the conversation. <laughs> Tricky when your boss is in the room and you get that question. Right? You've got to put your hand up or you're fired. Right? This is the point. In a time poor, busy life, we're all truncating and shortening everything. We've got the, you know, we've got technology with us 24 hours a day now, so it's go, go, go. There's no break. So often, because we're time poor, we forget the human part. So it might be something like, Phil, where's that report? That's how it starts. Phil, where's that report? As opposed to, Phil, thank you very much for your contribution in the meeting on Wednesday. I thought that was great. You brought up a point we hadn't considered. By the way, <laughs> how's that report coming along? Which conversation would you rather have? The first one or the second one? We'd all rather have the second one, but we forget to have the second one because we say, time for... Where's your report? What's happening with that project? Where are we in the budget? Where are the sales? Why are these numbers so low? <laughs> right? That's what happens. We get this truncated conversation which forgets this bit. So think about your conversations with your colleagues and with your subordinates, if you've got a team, try and start from a different approach. That's principle number 22. Here's another one. Talk about your own mistakes before criticising others. Now, Often the people who are working for us are younger or less experienced than we are. That's generally why we're the boss. Right? We've, just had, we've done more, we've seen more, been better at different things. And we forget that we were their age and their stage in our careers. We presume they should know what we know at our stage when their stage is here. So we get straight into, you made a mistake. That was wrong. Look, you left this out. You did this report. It's rubbish! Right? So you're straight into it. But think about when you were coming through. How did you learn? All of us. How did we learn? What did we do to learn? We made mistakes, didn't we? We are all the sum product of every mistake we've ever made. Because that's how we got knowledge, insight, and how we went forward, how we learnt. But we suspend that generosity to ourselves when we deal with our peers and our subordinates. And we criticize. So, you might want to say, you know what, I, gee, I remember when I, uh, I was first in this department and I was given the task of writing the, writing the report, I struggled. Uh, it was really hard. My boss had to really help me a lot to, to make it ship shape, make it correct. And you talk about, you weren't perfect. That is a great emotional connection. If you're like, I'm Mr. or Miss Perfect, and you be like me, and you'll be good, that's going to be a hard act to maintain. If you are shy, you're a human being, and you are not perfect, people find that easier to follow. If you're like that, like that fist, you cannot penetrate and be one with that fist. This is the one you want, together. But you can't be together like that. It doesn't work. You've got to relax, open up, show some vulnerability. This is a good place to start. Now, this is a very, very critical one. This is principle number 25 in Dale Cunningham's principles. Right? There are 30 of them in the human relations principles. Don't miss this one. Most of us have grown up in business being a product of being told what to do. That's how we learn. On the job training is the default training mechanism in Japan. So you've got some mediocre or crap senior senpai teaching you. And then you do the same to the next generation. And the next generation. And the next generation. And you're just like, pass the parcel type of thing, right? Ask questions. Why would we ask questions instead of just telling people what to do? We're time poor. Why not just tell them what to do? Why should we ask questions? What do you think? Why should we ask questions? What's in it for us? Yeah, what do you think? Generates new ideas. Generates new ideas? What else? Sorry, I couldn't quite catch that. It stimulates them to remember it because they have to come up with it on their own. 
Yes, it stimulates them to recall that piece of information that's come up because they've now got ownership. And that key word is ownership. When you tell them you own it, when you invite them to self-discover it, they own it. And what we found in training is that when we invite people to self-discover, they have permanent learning. And it's the same in leading. If you can get people to self-discover, you will have people sign on own what they need to do and not forget what they need to do. So that's a very critical phase. And this is also important. Praising the slice of improvement, every improvement. When we ask people to step out of their comfort zone, it's very, it's very scary. People worry. You know, they worry, oh, I might make a mistake, I might be criticised, you know, I feel scared. So we don't wait to the end of the project or the end of the program to reward them. It's like, you know, I'll save it up for Christmas, you know, I'll put it all in the Christmas bag and I'll bring all the presents out for once a year. Every time you see someone step up, recognise it. That gives them confidence to try a little bit further because they're hesitant. They're watching you. If I make a mistake, are you going to come down on me? I love this, you know, give me your ideas, I can implement that, and then BANG! You whack them when it doesn't go perfectly. Right? Don't do that. Look for the opportunities to help them grow. Same thing here. When they've got a problem, often they're, they're overwhelmed. They're like, oh, I can't do this. Uh, it's beyond me. Uh, I just, I'm lost. You've got to give them hope. And you use encouragement to make the fault seem like it is scalable. You can do this. This will work. And don't forget to give that positive feedback to them and keep their motivation to keep trying. Because often people just go, well, I'm... Statistics, I might give up my statistics, you know, I can't do it. Just can't give up my statistics. And then, <laughs> and then the lecturer will give you some encouragement, show you something where you can do it, and then eventually you do do it. Same thing in business. And then this is critical. You know, if you own it, you've got to drive it. What you want is for them to own it. And if they are happy to do the thing that you suggest, they will take it and run with it. So you can delegate things to people. I heard a great quote the other day. <coughs> Most people don't delegate. You know why? They're in the boat and they've got the paddle and they're paddling like crazy. They're so busy paddling, they didn't walk over and turn on the engine in the boat. And that engine is your people. That engine is your subordinates who've got the capacity to drive and the power to really make that boat go fast. But you're too busy paddling to do that because you're doing it all yourself. So, getting people happy to do anything you suggest is critical around delegation. But most delegation is dumping. Phil, here's a report. I want it tomorrow. Walk away. Seagull. If you know seagull management, right? Squarks a lot, plop, and leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so, what you want is to get them involved, explain them what, get them signed on, have the ownership, and they will absorb the delegation and they will run with it. So, feed forward. Here's a, a bonus point for you, in addition to Dale Penny's principle. This is in terms of giving some follow-up to people after they've done a project on the way through. We often call it feedback. But I'm calling it feed forward. Because what we're looking for here is two streams of comment. Tell people what they were doing that was good. And then tell them, how to do it better. But often you hear, oh no, oh no, no, no. You've got to critique them. We're here to critique you. So what do we do when we critique? We spend all our time in the past talking about something that we cannot change. If you go into going forward, right, feed forward, you're talking about what's working for them. Now sometimes people won't know what's working. They won't be aware of it. And you tell them, you know what, this is really good. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, okay. Well, I'll keep doing that. That's good. To reinforce the positives they have. And then the better part is the future. We're not worried about what happened in the past now. We're on the front foot going forward. It's all very positive momentum. So feed forward is a very powerful mechanism for you to take people with you on the journey, using your people skills, using your communication. So I said earlier that... Uh, We've only got a limited amount of time. We're about to go to Q&A very shortly. But uh, think about your technical skills versus your people skills. And think about what you can do to make things work for you. And uh, 
in terms of, we're limited in time here, but if you'd like to get more information or you're looking for more help, uh, if you go to this website, uh, this japan.daltony.com, that's the English site, there's a mirror Japanese site there, there's lots of free stuff there for you. There's uh, lots of, uh, the Daltony principles are all there, you can download them. You've got white books, you've got guide books, you've got 250 videos, you've got uh, 60 odd podcasts, you've got numerous blogs. There's a lot of practical stuff. This is not anything that you're going to get in McGill because McGill's operating at a much more academic and higher macro level. This is, this is the nitty gritty, practical, daily, immediate use stuff compiled into one place. So, if you get a chance, go in and have a look at that. And this isn't the stuff you've got to wait to get at the NBA to say, oh, okay, now I can use it because I'm now in the power position. This is you can use it right now. Wherever you are right now, it'll work for you. So let me open it up for questions. We have, Phil, how many minutes have we got for questions? I'm looking at about 10 here. Would that be about right? Yeah, sure. We can go 10. We can go a little bit longer. Bit we'll say probably 10. Yeah. We can get 10. We have 10 minutes for questions. Who has the first question? Yeah, we have some microphones. Oh yeah, that'd be good too if we got some mics. So who has the first question? <coughs> yeah, please. Um, so my question goes with when a lot of managers use these kind of things, group uh, communication. Being on the lower echelons, one of the things I tend to hear is it comes out sometimes negative, almost patronizing, and the term double speak is kind of popped up for it. Oh, you're not doing very well. The, the company's like a house, so you know we can't give you the raise. Some people don't like that sometimes. It's kind of interesting. I mean, I, a lot of this does work. I agree with it, but there's some people that hate that kind of speech. So, what would you do in these kind of situations? The question was about congruency between the content of the message and the delivery of the message. When you're getting feedback from the boss. But your crap detector goes off because it doesn't sound quite right to you. That's because there's not a congruency between the two. So the first part is kokoro gamai in Japanese, the starting point of your intention. If your real intention is to snow people and tell them a bunch of words, you'll get that reaction. If your real intention is to help people, you'll speak from the heart and they'll be congruent and they will follow it. Reading a, you know, a blog article or reading a book or TED lecture or something and taking the superficial and then parlaying that into a conversation is still superficial. And we are not stupid. You know, we spot crap so quickly. So my answer to that question is speak from the heart and speak truly about how to help that person and then they will receive the communication, they'll realize it's sincere. You see in there, in the darkening principle, it's sincere, it's honest. It's all of those words are critical because fake praise or that type of fakery, it doesn't work because we're too smart. We're just way too smart all of us. And don't use it yourself. Speak from the heart. And you might have to say something hard and something corrective, but if you say it in the right way, with the right intention, with good communication, the person will receive it without resistance. That's the skill. That's the people skill. That's the communication skill. And that's a trained skill. This is not something we are innately born with. That's why you have organizations which are 102 years old around the world and 51 years in Japan like Dale Carnegie because there's a never-ending need for those sorts of skills and we need to develop those. Who's the next question? Yes, please. <coughs> uh, sorry, actually, I, I think uh, uh, soft communication all those uh, principles uh, look good to me, but what I see uh, day by day life, uh, when one person or one leader tries to do like that, uh, he has to, like somebody in the team will take charge with uh, some harsh word or something. So that's like uh, what normally happens that that harsh person will become a leader or he, everyone follows him. What I mean to say that uh, being softer, will not be uh, move up I mean, when the surrounding people all know the same level of knowledge. So the question is, if I give truckloads of whip to people and no sweeties, I'm going straight to the top because that seems to work in business. Well, it 
doesn't work in business because the person who's brutal with other people will only get a certain compliance of doing the task. They won't get the innovative ideas. They won't get the extra mile. They won't get people to back them and support them. Everyone is hoping they're going to self-destruct and disappear. <laughs> being a leader doesn't mean being a pushover. It doesn't mean holding people to account. If I've delegated a task to you and you screw it up or you don't do it, it doesn't mean going, oh, whoopsie, you didn't do the task. That's all right. I'll do it. No. It means you hold them to account. You come back and you check. Has this been done properly? How's it going? You actually get yourself involved in the solution because you recognise that certain people need that type of help, others don't. It's not a matter of being a pushover. It's a matter of communicating with people in a way that's effective about getting the task done, but in a way which doesn't kill their motivation. And again, this communication piece is not necessarily something that's going to be there just because you speak the language that you speak, whatever your native mother tongue may be. This takes work, this takes training, this takes skill, this takes brain power to think about how you're going to sculpt that conversation in a way that will help that person to overcome a mistake, not be totally discouraged, but give them hope, but still hold them accountable. That's the balance. So it's not such a simple black-white thing as, oh, be sweet or be mean. It's actually be professional, but have a good communication balance that helps people to feel encouraged to keep trying, and also that you keep them accountable, keep them on track. There's the next question. Yeah, please. So the question is about performance measurement. And it could be performance measurement for a training company or it could be performance measurement for a team. And often we use surveys for that. We will do uh, a pre-survey, take a, a bit of a temperature check on how that person is doing as the leader. We will then from that customise a program for that person or people, depending on what the organisation is deliver it, and then take a temperature check at the end. One of the things we noticed, though, that's quite unique, I think, about the system Dale that he came up with, is the practicality and the immediacy. We use a thing called time-space learning, which is what you're doing, basically. Every week you're here, and during the week you're practicing and developing and, and polishing. We do the same thing. So that between the classes, people get a chance in the real world to practice these principles with others and see how they work, and then get that feedback and come back and report. And then it's that plan, do, act, kaizen type of idea. So uh, what we notice is over the, the we have an eight week course called the Dalpani course. We notice around about week four, week five, people really start to take off because at the initial part they're a bit skeptical. You know, this stuff looks pretty simplistic. You know, it's going to really work. Then they try it, and this is what we hear. You know, ah, oh, my colleague, you know, I could never get my colleague to help me. I was always too busy and. You know, uh, I, I used this principle and this principle and I couldn't believe it. My colleague changed or, you can't believe it! My boss took me lunch! Boss never takes anybody to lunch! But I used this principle and we had this sort of conversation and blah, blah. Like Warren Buffett, it changes lives because it's immediate, it's practical. And it's got a, a no, no time weight disadvantage to it. I think we're just about pretty much at the time, I think, Phil, for this. We're pretty much there. Um, as I said before, if you would like to have the slides, uh, hopefully the video works, or at least the audio will work, hopefully, uh, I'm, I'm happy to give it to you. So you've got a few moments, I think, before your next class starts. So I brought, uh, brought lots of meishi today, so if you want to uh, give me, hit me with a meishi, or even receive my meishi and hit me with an email, I'll send it out to you. Thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, good luck with your Thank you for joining the Leadership Japan series. If you found the program useful, then you might consider subscribing on iTunes and leaving a review. Remember to access your Dale Carnegie training, free reports, white papers, guidebooks, training videos, blogs, newsletters, course information, plus much, much more. Then go to japan.dale.com. 
carnegie.com.